also the director of the business advising program here. And this is our second annual Justice William Strong Lecture on Ethics and the Business Lawyer. And sort of the beginnings of this, I was visiting alums in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania, and I was walking over by the, uh, the, the Burke County Bar Association building, and there was a sign that said, Justice William Strong, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, practiced and lived in Reading, Pennsylvania. And I thought, that's extraordinary. I, I hadn't realized that we had someone here in central Pennsylvania. And so I've, I've claimed him for the law school by naming our, uh, our lecture series about him. And he's a very interesting individual. And uh, uh, Professor Alexander has, done, has actually found some things that I didn't know about him that I think will add to our discussion and give a real appreciation for different ways to, to look through the law and everything. Um, I'm thrilled uh, uh, to bring uh, Professor Alexander to the law school. Uh, Kern and I have known each other for probably 25 years or so. We write in a similar area and have attended conferences. This is the second time I brought him back to the, the States to, uh, to lecture for us. And, and one reason I was particularly interested in having uh, Professor Alexander come and speak with us is that he brings a very unique perspective in that he was educated undergraduate both in the United States and also in, uh, in the UK. And so he, he genuinely can, he sees the law from, from both sides of the Atlantic on that and, and can provide a really unique perspective. A lot of individuals that, that practice in the area of comparative law know one area particularly well, but don't understand the other side nearly as well. And he understands both perfectly and can provide us with really a unique uh, perspective and help us to uh, appreciate the issues that he's going to uh, to be dealing with. He has a terrific background. I encourage you to, to look at the, um, the program and to, uh, to see uh, you know, his accomplishments. And he's, uh, he just brings a, a wonderful view of the law, very uh, holistic and, uh, and broad-based. And I'm, I'm actually really anxious to, to learn more about Justice Strong and to see how he's uh, has developed your, uh, your theme and, and topic. So we'll go ahead and turn the time over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Johnson, for the very uh, gracious introduction. Uh, and thank you all for attending uh, today uh, to hear my, my, my talk on Justice William Strong. And I'm going to, uh, my presentation is really based on the um, uh, some of his, uh, from what I've learned about him over the last few months, Professor Johnson contacted me last summer and said, would you be interested in coming here for some time in the, in, in the autumn uh, to, uh, to give this lecture? And I didn't know who William Strong was. And, uh, and, and, I, and he said he had been a U.S. Supreme Court justice. So I, you know, I, on Google, I looked up some of the writings and there was a, kind of a, a biography written about him online and a few other short articles. And I, and I have to say that at first I, I, I thought this is not one of the Supreme Court justices that, that I knew about in law school when I was studying. And he's not, certainly not one of the famous constitutional scholars that, that, that we often hear about, especially in the 19th century during the period of, uh, of the Civil War and some of the great uh, U.S. Supreme Court decisions. But the more I read, in, read about his life, the more impressed I became. And, and the more I learned about his impact on the court when he was there, and, and also some of the ideals and the philosophy, his philosophy of jurisprudence, you might say, and, and how he is kind of classified as a very religious man who was concerned with moral values. And so then you think, well, he was sort of maybe a religious extremist, possibly, or that he was a fundamentalist or an evangelical. Uh, but actually, the more you read about his life, uh, you see that his philosophy of jurisprudence uh, reflected a belief in natural law and natural law that, which accepted morality 
uh, morality could be one of the tests in determining the validity of laws. And, and that's something that was very common in the 19th century. Uh, it's only really in the 20th century that, we, that uh, legal scholarship, uh, that positivism sort of took over and that the separation of law and mor morality became more uh, accepted and more uh, discussed. But, but in his time, he, his ideas were reflected more of a mainstream view that in order to understand law more thoroughly, one had to engage with moral principles. One had to think about how we can use moral principles or ethical values to help us uh, interpret the law and interpret um, uh, what law might mean. And, uh, and so strong, and of course this is a picture, he seems to be very stern in this picture. And, and, and he grew up in Connecticut and he was, uh, he was a Presbyterian, and he grew up in Connecticut at a time when there was a state religion in Connecticut, and the Congregationalist were, was enshrined in state law, and, 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 and the, there were prohibitions on stores being open on Sunday, and if you used the Lord's name in vain, you could be prosecuted for blasphemy. And, and, and even Yale College at this time, in the early, uh, at the time, uh, a strong attendant at Yale as an undergraduate, its president, Timothy Dwight, uh, had stated that any student who, uh, who commits blasphemy or uses the Lord's name in vain or commits any other moral violation will be, uh, will be kicked out of school, will be kicked out of Yale. And, and so, so Yale was a very strict, stern place. Uh, governed by a very strict uh, code of Protestant, you might say, Protestant evangelical thought, and, and this, but but this was something that was very common uh, in uh, in in at this time in the 1820s, and and in America, in many of the colon in many of the states that had been English colonies, where some of them were more religious in their uh, colonial background uh, before they became states, and therefore religion played a very important role, uh, not just uh, in the church, but also in policy and government and those who led society. And so Strong kind of is a man of his times, you might say. And, that, and, and, uh, and, and so that's one thing. Now, so of course, uh, for Strong, faith and religion were important for him as a, as a judge and as a lawyer. Uh, while, while he recognized the need for separation of church and state, uh, he accepted that in the Constitution. He felt God should not be separate from the state, and that for us to understand fully what the Constitution means, uh, to give it meaningful application in society, we need to be engaged with moral principles. And, 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 and those principles, he felt in America, were the principles of Christianity. Of, of uh, the, the principles of the Bible, and and, and this, of course, today we were much you know stricter. We like to keep state separate from religion, but at this time, this was a very a, a much more common view. And this is a quote from a, a historian of this, uh, who wrote a biography of his life, Jonathan T. Ford. He said, "But this, but but this did not mean the nation should be godless, without recognition granted the Creator in its constitutions and law." Now, strong as uh, Professor Johnson pointed out practice law in Reading. He was a business lawyer and he became a specialist in patent law and admiralty law and kind of specialized areas of commercial law. Uh, but in the 1860s, in the aftermath of the American Civil War, um, Strong led a movement that was known as the National Reform Association, an organization that sought to amend the U.S. Constitution. And as, and as you, if you're uh, familiar with constitutional history, you'll know that the 14th Amendment was passed in the 1860s, and there was a lot of constitutional uh, revision going on in the U.S., and Strong led a group that had advocated uh, uh, amending the U.S. Constitution that, to have a preamble to say this, we the people of the United States humbly acknowledging Almighty God as the source of all authority and power and civil government, the Lord Jesus Christ is the governor among nations and his revealed will as of supreme authority in order to constitute a Christian government, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And so this would get, so the proposal was to put this into the preamble of the U.S. Constitution and amend it. Um, now, this didn't pass, uh, but yet uh, Mr. Strong was very much in the, in the vanguard 
of advocates for change. And, try, and, and one of the reasons Strong advocated this preamble, according to Jonathan T. Ford, his biographer, was that he was, he was um, despondent at, the, at what, how the Civil War had torn America apart, at the fight between the southern states and the northern states, and what seemed to be different interpretations of the US Constitution. Um, and that the southern states had interpreted uh, the Constitution in a way that would protect states' rights, to protect the institution of slavery, and that there were, and there were these such contentious, conflicting interpretations of the Constitution that Strong felt that the Constitution needed to be guided more by moral principles and ethical values. Strong was an abolitionist. He was a Democrat who was an abolitionist. And he believed strongly that, that, um, that his ethical values were such that he felt the Constitution should, uh, should be clear that, that it's based on Christian principles and that Christian principles would, would be abhorrent uh, with slavery. And, and so, so it was all part of you know, the political context of the time. And, and so, so Strong at the time as a Democrat, he was an abolitionist Democrat in Pennsylvania. He was elected to the state legislature for two terms. He then was elected to the state Supreme Court. And as an abolitionist Democrat, he was popular with Republicans. And he was appointed by U Ulysses S. Grant as a Supreme Court Justice in 1869. And he took office in, he was confirmed in 1870. And, and so, so he was, um, he, he, uh, abolitionism was a very important tenet in his, in his political philosophy. He was a man of politics as well as a man of the law. And he felt that morality should be very important in interpreting the law, but also in guiding one's political philosophy. Um, uh, nevertheless, despite what I think is a pretty interesting uh, dynamic background in this period of time, when he, when he joined the court, he was regarded merely as the court's leading authority on patent law, but was not a great dissenter or constitutional innovator, but rather a capable jurist who, as his biographer said, who wrestled with troublesome questions of patents, admiralty, and revenue law. <laughs> and so, so, it's, so in a way, the, kind of a lot of the literature about him sort of de-emphasizes uh, uh, parts of his life which I think probably were not given adequate attention, uh, such as his role in um, you know, leading uh, change and wanting to amend the Constitution. Um, however, this view neglects the impact of some of his most important opinions when he was on the Supreme Court. And so most of you, if, you're, uh, if you've studied law in the US, you would have read the Strauder versus West Virginia case, uh, in which the, uh, uh, Mr. Strong was the uh, opinion writer for the majority in this case. And they basically applied the 14th Amendment. Uh, it was applicable to the states to prevent discriminatory laws based on race in the selection of juries. And if you read uh, Mr. Strong's opinion in Strauder versus West Virginia, you quickly get, you feel the power of his concern about, about, uh, about African Americans and how they were uh, mistreated and how, and how a race of people in America had been economically, politically, socially subjugated and legally subjugated by the law and that it was necessary to, 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 to interpret the law in order to give them more autonomy and he uses the word autonomy in the Strauder case very much. He says, he, he says black Americans, uh, need the, the law needs to apply to them to help give them more autonomy in their life, autonomy and being citizens, full citizens of, of, of the US. And, and so he refers to this you know, phrase of autonomy and, and he basically makes a very important decision uh, that it states that West Virginia's uh, laws, which had prohibited women and blacks from serving on juries, uh, was unconstitutional. Uh, and, and, so, so that was, and, and so that's probably the, the case he's known the most for. But there were other cases in which, he, uh, uh, in which he joined in the majority opinion or wrote the majority opinion. Uh, Stone versus Mississippi in the same year concerned double jeopardy and whether a defendant could be retried after a mistrial due to a jury deadlock. And th in this case, he applied equitable principles of law, the laws of equity, to basically hold that um, that a mistrial, that that double jeopardy um, should apply 
if a jury is um, has been impaneled and a jury makes it this, uh, and if a jury is deadlocked, then that would have uh, that would prevent the state from retrying a case again. And, and so, so the principle of double jeopardy is one that he wrote about in this decision, and also the importance of equitable principles and understanding the scope of the right against double jeopardy. Uh, in Davidson versus New Orleans, it was a case about retroactive taxation of, of, of city bonds that were issued by the city of New Orleans. He, uh, in this case, uh, he joined the majority opinion which held that, that, that New Orleans uh, city bonds had violated the contract clause of the U.S. Constitution um, because they were retroactive in their effect. And so, so, he, he, and so he was fervently opposed to retroactive uh, laws that had uh, uh, w and felt that that was um, a violation of equitable principles. Again, uh, principles of fairness and uh, and uh, being applied in his understanding of the law. And then, very famously, the slaughterhouse cases of 1873 was a very important case in which he interpreted the 14th Amendment privileges and, Im and immunities clause as not covering economic rights, which basically upheld a Louisiana law that had granted a monopoly on slaughterhouse operations in New Orleans uh, to the city of New Orleans. And that the, and, and this case was very important for influencing equal protection jurisprudence and also for striking a balance in, 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 how, in what power the state had to regulate uh, economic activity. And in Munn versus Illinois, another case involving regulation uh, of economic activity, he upheld a regulation of grain elevators and warehouses in order to protect pub public interest. So in, in each of these cases, Strong has uh, he uses more he refers to moral principles, ethical values in order to give us a more fuller understanding of the law, and 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 to, and to understand. Uh, in some of the cases, what is the extent of regulation in society and, and the extent that regulation can limit business and can limit freedom uh, of, of, of economic rights. While his decisions are not mainly focused on business ethics, they apply ethics to achieve a balancing of legal principles with societal interests. Most important for business, an overview of his judgments recognize the role of government regulation in promoting fairness and protecting the public interest within the realm of commerce. His jurisprudence sets forth principles for business lawyers uh, today in considering the role of corporate law in society and corporate governance and the balance to be struck between shareholder rights and stakeholder rights. That's kind of my uh, conclusion at the bottom. And that's really what I want to talk about is really what I, I call his enduring influence because I think uh, um, that by using ethical principles and values, um, one can, can basically add to our understanding of, of the law and what it means. And I think that in the area of corporate law and particularly corporate purpose, this is a, a very relevant topic. Uh, right Today, if for those of you who follow the corporate governance debate and reform of corporate governance in the U.S. and Europe, uh, there is a great legal debate over, over whether or not companies should have a so-called corporate purpose and what their corporate purpose should be. Should it be simply to make more profits for shareholders, for the owners of the company? Or should companies have broader objectives, broader purposes that involve the protection of so-called stakeholders? And I'll talk about that today, who these stakeholders are. Uh, and, 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 and so can we use some of Justice Strong's emphasis on morals and ethical values to help us understand more fully corporate law and the scope of corporate governance responsibilities. Also, there's a great financial and economic debate that is related to this legal debate uh, regarding how the corporation should be modeled in developing a theory of the firm and evaluating different types of corporate governance structures and arrangements and in studying the effect of particular changes on firms. And uh, the, traditionally, and until today, in the United States, still the majority view is of share, so-called shareholder value. And, and this is measured in terms of the, the stock price of companies' shares, 
at, or their market capitalization. And, and that's understood to be the proxy for firm value and sometimes for economic efficiency. But I will submit today that by looking at broader ethical values and, and, and a type of, you might say, ethical interpretation of corporate law, we might go beyond simply what is market capitalization of a firm and how much their share price is and think, are there other ways that we might measure how a company is fulfilling its duty in society? Do companies have further duties? If so, are they fulfilling them? And, and also how this applies to management strategy, how best to build valuable and sustainable firms. What is the best business strategy for solving uh, key management challenges, namely organizing the various participants in the firm to work together as a team to produce great products and services uh, and to build a great company, but is there also broader corporate governance challenges that we might expect companies to perform. And this is all part of a broader political and ethical debate in society that examines the social role of large corporations, the obligations imposed on publicly traded companies, uh, what uh, should, should large companies be subjected to these corporate governance uh, standards, or, or should to what extent should it apply in the commercial world? And whether current economic arrangements are politically legitimate, and of course, uh, is the regulation of companies supporting environmental and social sustainability? So, so th this is kind of the, the modern context that we might try to apply Justice Strong's uh, emphasis on morality and, and understanding the law. Now, none other than Professor Elizabeth Warren, I should say Senator Elizabeth Warren, has raised this issue in the American context. And so when she was running for president, she uh, had, had several policy papers on the reform of US corporations. And she wrote that American corporations exist only because the American people grant them charters. Those charters confer valuable privileges, such as limited legal liability for their owners, that enable businesses to turn a profit. What do Americans get in return, she asked. What are the obligations of corporate citizenship in the United States? And that's the very essence. You know, what are those obligations that companies should have to society? Uh, are they ethically inspired? Um, there, should their duties be ethically inspired? Is there a moral basis on which we might understand what corporations' duties to the broader community are? And. Um, and so, and this is very relevant in the, uh, over in the last 25 years, we've had the emergence of the of environmental and social governance, so-called ESG issues have risen up the agenda, focus on climate change. Uh, the UN, these are the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, goal 13 is uh, the, the focus on climate change, uh, but not just on climate change. There's a focus on uh, biodiversity loss, uh, pollution, uh, uh, there's also a focus on social sustainability that looks at gender and racial equality. It looks at economic equality. It looks at health care for, uh, for, for all. Uh, and, and as a result, companies uh, are developing markets, certainly in Europe, but even in the U.S., there are growing markets in so-called green bonds and social bonds and in nature bonds. So, so, so in thinking about a broader view of what the role of the company is in society, we should have regard to these UN SDGs, the, the, these uh, Sustainable Development Goals, I, I would submit. Now, now, is this a new debate? Um, actually, not really. Um, if you look back into the early 20th century, the great, uh, th there was a great de uh, debate, two articles in the Harvard Law Review between uh, one by Adolf Burrell and the other by Merrick Dodd. Amer Adolf, Adolf Burrell was a was a practitioner in New York and was a prominent, he wrote articles about corporate law. Um, he also, Merrick Dodd was a professor of law at Harvard Law School. And basically what Burrell wrote in this debate about corporate purpose, about what is the role of the corporation, Burrell wrote, all powers granted to a corporation or to the management of a corporation are necessarily and at all times exercisable only for the benefit of all shareholders. Of Managers are what he called trustees for shareholders, and that's their full duty, their, their full role. Merrick Dodd, on the other hand, said managers of a company, the board of directors and the managers they hire, owe their duties to the corporate entity as fiduciaries for the institution rather than for its members, the shareholders. 
uh, and they had a duty to manage multiple constituencies' interests, different constituencies, employees, creditors, suppliers, customers. They had a duty to manage these multiple interests, uh, and it was only effective for them to do so if they have some degree of what he called legal freedom to act upon such an attitude. Now, this was a, a bit, a, an important debate because the United States was in the early stages of the Great Depression, and there was a big concern at the time in the, by, by the U.S. government about whether or not companies should help support social policies to help mitigate the impact of the Great Depression. And Merrick Dodd in this article also writes that even though it might be more profitable for companies to lay off more employees, because we are in a major economic downturn, companies should do what they can to keep employees employed, even though it might reduce the profits for shareholders. And Burl said this would create too much discretion for, for, for company managers to basically expropriate shareholder money. So this was a great standoff. That, that although it's talked about today by Professor Warren, Elizabeth Warren, this goes back to the 1930s. Germany also went through a similar period. At this time, German corporate law was being revised, and, and there was a, two different perspectives. There was a contractual interpretation of the corporation and an institutional interpretation of the corporation. Uh, who, which in, is the institutional uh, uh, interest of the company different from its shareholders? And so, and, and so German corporate law was changed, and there was the adoption of what they have, a two-tiered board in which employees had a right to elect members of the board of directors. And, and this thinking was based on the fact that companies were not just existing to make money for shareholders, but they had a duty to serve the interest of other stakeholders, other stakeholders. And so German law had evolved in this way to reflect this. Now, later in, in 1970, Milton Friedman wrote a very important article uh, supporting the view of Adolf Burl in 1931. And Friedman basically advocated the shareholder wealth maximization view. Uh, Friedman's ideas were developed further by Professor Jensen at, at the Harvard Business School, who developed agency models to, to, to determine how we might align the incentives of corporate managers to reflect shareholder incentives, basically using share, share, price, share price of the company as part payment for compensation. So Jensen very much believed that the role of corporate governance, corporate decision making ought to be based on the uh, interest of shareholders, not the broader, uh, not, not broader third party stakeholders. These views have informed the modern debate on shareholder versus stakeholder primacy. And, so, and, and stakeholder primacy is also, also, also referred to as corporate social responsibility. Should companies have a purpose uh, other than to make money? That's the question. Uh, today we have the, um, the urgency uh, about, of climate change and climate catastrophe uh, affecting the economy, flooding around the world and, and other uh, en environmental phenomena. We, there's a necessity to make a transition to a green economy and to adopt a more sort of sustainable approach to economic activity. And so, and so this is kind of a, a, a Milton Friedman's article uh, emphasized shareholder primacy. Uh, to summarize uh, uh, Friedman's approach, he said, when shareholders invest, they become part owners of the company or at least of the company's business. Shareholders have the right to the company's residual income. This legitimates the shareholders' right to have a company run exclusively in their own interest. Any deviation undermines respect for private property ownership, he argued which requires property to be used in the interest of owners and no other group. Employees and other third parties are outsiders to the, uh, uh, with respect to the company's operations. Statutory intervention in the employment ar bargain is illegitimate, and it's an intrusion into the private realm of shareholder control. So Friedman was very, you know, uh, strong in his view. And this view of Friedman uh, took the form of what this corporate lawyers call the aggregate theory. The aggregate theory means we can only really understand uh, the, the, the duties and the rights of those in a co corporation by understanding um, who are its members, uh, who does the company consist of. And the aggregate theory holds that the company consists of the shareholders or its members. Um, and this, and it's not just uh, uh, an exceptional U.S. view. This was also reflected in the U.K. company's legislation. Uh, the provisions of a company's constitution bind the company and its members to the same extent as if there were covenants on the part of the company and of each member to observe those provisions. Contractual relationships 
according to the interpretation of, UK, of United Kingdom company law, are determinative of obligations and the duties of the board. Majority decision of contractors, the shareholders, represent the company will, not, not other third-party uh, groups who are affected by the company's actions. Contractually negotiated rules of company governance by shareholders serve as the will of the corporation. So we look to the shareholders to find out what the purpose of the company is. If they think it's to make more money, so be it. It's to make more money. Should the shareholders decide? And so the corporation is basically entitled to autonomy from state regulation as a general rule. Uh, and, it, and this reflects a classical laissez-faire approach. And this has become the common corporate law practice in Western Europe and in the United States. Certainly the practice of the Delaware Court of Chancery, which is the, the main court that deals with corporate law disputes in Delaware, follows this kind of aggregate theory of the company. Now this is also reflected in business practice, this focus on shareholders and what's good for them. And this is the Business Roundtable, uh, a group of the leading companies in the United States. In 1997, uh, they wrote, uh, the, highlighting in red, uh, some of the main points, the interest of other stakeholders are relevant as a derivative of the duty to stockholders. The notion that the board must somehow balance the interests of stockholders against the interests of other stakeholders fundamentally misconstrues the role of directors. And so, so essentially, uh, it's, it, it's an unworkable notion to let the board of directors and its managers try to manage a corporation for third party uh, stakeholders. The focus should be on what's good for shareholders and what shareholders want. Now, this view derived from Friedman uh, and the Business Roundtable and, and basically kind of the corporate law practice of many countries uh, in, in Western Europe and the United States, this uh, seems to be um, at odds with some of the goals of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals and, and, and the concept of what's called corporate so social responsibility, which looks to the, the, the principle of managing a company not just for the benefit of shareholders, but also for the benefit of third party stakeholders in the company. And so we, we see a number of other principles in the CSR debate, such as the, the social role of the company, uh, whether or what the company, its business practices, are they equitable, fair, sustainable, viable? Do they support environmental sustainability? And so, so this is kind of where we are today. And this is, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the business school uh, community, this is known as the social institutional model. Also, uh, you might say it relates to corporate social responsibility. And, and, and this holds that it's not adequate to characterize the company through artificial concession theory or the focus on primacy, primary, primacy of shareholders. Instead, we should look at private organizations as social enterprises, this view holds. Uh, which st uh, in, in which the state should regulate companies for the public good. Um, uh, and we should, and, and the social institutional model holds that um, there should be a move away from shareholder exclusiveness. Companies need to be managed for shareholder benefit, but also for the benefit of third party stakeholders. Uh, this creates different perspectives on corporate governance a so-called benign managerial model in which the company's duty is to behave like a good citizen in business. The stakeholder mo model is also advocated in which there's a need for laws ensuring that the interests of the various constituencies are reflected. And finally, th the whole recent emphasis on ESG. This is part of the social institutional model. This says that we should look to a broader purpose for corporations in society. Now, one reason that this focus has arisen is because it addresses some of the problems with so-called short-termism of shareholder uh, reports. Uh, there's been an excessive focus on short-term results of company performance, not on their long-term interest, uh, focusing on quarterly earnings, no attention paid to the strategy of the company, um, and to its long-term value creation. Corporations are too often responding to these pressures by reducing their expenditures on research and development and or foregoing investment opportunities with long-term potential. Uh, these decisions can weigh against companies' development of sustainable products uh, or investment uh, uh, that would deliver operational efficiencies, develop their human capital, and effectively manage the social and environmental risk to their business. So, th so th there's a pressure to move away from short-termism by embracing stakeholderism, and, and this requires us to rediscuss what corporate purpose is. How might it help 
uh, our understanding of the company and moving away. And this would, and, and this would help us take it, uh, corporate governance, it, this argues, should take into account the interests of all stakeholders. Stakeholderism is an extension of shareholder primacy, one might argue. Um, uh, maximizing long-term shareholder value depends also on uh, supporting stakeholder interest. Uh, the UK Companies Act in 2006 was amended to reflect the interest of stakeholders, um, uh, factors to consider when enhancing shareholder value. Um, and, there, and, and there's also the theory of pluralistic stakeholderism. So stakeholderism has influenced recent developments in corporate law. And this is from the UK Company Act. In 2006, I mentioned the UK is based on the aggregate theory of law that looks at what's in, in the interest of shareholders. And, and so in the, in the act basically says that a director of a company must act in the way he considers in good faith would be most likely to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members, of its shareholders as a whole. But, and in doing so, have regard to the likely consequences of any decision in the long term, the interest of the company's employees, the need to foster the company's business relationships with suppliers, customers, and others, and the impact of the company's operations on the community and the environment. So we see that UK company law has evolved somewhat where they continue to emphasize shareholder and the importance of shareholders, but yet recognizing the the, 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 the importance of third-party groups, uh, stakeholders in the company. And this is being legally recognized. Uh, and, so, so, and this is not just something that the law has recognized in, in the UK and other European countries, but it's also being recognized by institutional investors like the uh, American asset management firm BlackRock, which in 2018 wrote that um, society is demanding that companies, both public and private companies, serve a social purpose to prosper over time. Every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. Companies must benefit all of their stakeholders, including shareholders, employees, customers, and the communities in which they operate. BlackRock updated that statement in 2020. Also, the World Economic Forum and Davos, they meet, they have adopted uh, a, a, a statement, a, a manifesto on stakeholder capitalism. Uh, for a cohesive and sustainable world, which is very similar to the BlackRock statement. Now, I mentioned earlier the Business Roundtable in 1997 had the very pro primacy of stakeholder, uh, primacy of stockholder uh, approach uh, to corporate governance. They changed. In 2019, they modified that view by writing in their uh, most recent statement of principles that while each of our individual companies serve its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. We commit to investing in our employees, dealing fairly and ethically with our suppliers, fostering diversity, inclusion, dignity, and respect, and protecting the environment by embracing sustainable practices across our businesses. And finally, in doing this, generating long-term value for shareholders. So even the American business lobby has shifted the focus, shifted its, you might say, its, its philosophical approach, kind of implementing, I might say, ethics and morality into the governance of corporations. We're not just in it to make more money, but we're in it to try to find a more sustainable uh, model of business operation that supports others in society. Um, now, there are legal risks, too, practical risk for companies that don't put stakeholders first, you might say. Uh, the famous case uh, in Oklahoma, Johnson & Johnson, uh, the, the big major American Corporation uh, in 1943 had adopted this, this uh, credo as its overriding philosophy, which I thought in 1943 was very uh, telling. It says Robert Wood Johnson describes his company's responsibilities in this order, patients, doctors, nurses, customers, business partners, employees, and communities, the environment, and natural resources. And then after all that, stockholders should realize a fair return. So this is in 1943. Uh, but Johnson & Johnson didn't really follow this credo so well. They were sued in a class action lawsuit by opioid uh, victims. Uh, and, 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 the, and the judge ruled in 2019 in an Oklahoma state court that the company uh, should be held for damages of $572 million for its alleged contribution to the opioid crisis in Oklahoma. 
Uh, even if J and J, as I understand, has appealed this decision, uh, this situation still shows that companies are increasingly expected to play a positive role in society and to take responsibility for the broader effects of their actions and products on society. Uh, even though the, the, these products were lawful when they were sold at the time. Companies are complicated. Their actions and words don't line up perfectly. A company can have the right principles on paper, but at times lose sight of what serving multiple stakeholders really means. And so, 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 so we see that there's legal risk for companies that don't follow a more ethical corporate governance approach. Um, now, I, I want to turn to Europe, just the two or three slides, and then I'll sum up. Um, Europe has addressed the whole issue of environmental and social governance a bit differently than the US uh, by having a large focus on using disclosure obligations, requiring companies to disclose their impact on the environment, their impact on society, their impact on their employees, their impact, uh, their internal governance, whether they have gender neutrality in their hiring practices. Do they have gender neutrality on the board of directors? Um, uh, are they promoting social and economic equality in their business operations? And so uh, it's hard to make to require a company to do that. But the UK and the EU have decided to require companies to report to report on their impact on ESG goals. Are they achieving them or not? They're not required to achieve them, but 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 customers should know, investors should know if they're achieving. Uh, ESG objectives or not. And so the focus in, in the UK and in Europe is on disclosure as a, a mechanism of enhancing corporate governance. And, and now in Europe, the, uh, the EU has recently passed last year the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. This would apply to the whole European Union. And this is a very, uh, very important legislation even for US companies because it has extraterritorial effect on any company doing business in Europe up to a certain threshold. And so the Corporate Social Re Responsibility Directive modernizes and strengthens the rules concerning social and environmental information that companies are required to report. Entry, it, it, be it became effective in January 2023. It applies to a broad set of large companies and also small and medium-sized companies uh, will now be required to do an annual report on their impact on ESG and sustainability practices. Again, it applies to, uh, uh, based on company size, large listed companies, large banks, large insurance companies, all if they have more than 500 employees and also large non-EU listed companies with more than 500 employees. Other large companies will be covered as well. Small and medium sized entities that are not listed on stock exchanges will be covered, uh, including non-EU small and medium sized enterprises that do business in Europe. And so the, the requirement is reporting. What do you report? Well, you report, the company is obliged to report both on their impact on people and the environment and on how social and environmental issues create financial risk and opportunities for the company. And then and they break it down into four categories, cross-cutting reporting requirements, where you have both environmental and social risk that affect the firm's business have to be reported. Then you have a category for environmental reporting, a category for social sustainability reporting, uh, and, and also governance, internal governance of the firm, uh, equality and treatment of the workforce. <clears throat> These general disclosures specify essential information to be disclosed irrespective of which sustainability matter is being considered. All other standards and the individual disclosure requirements and data points with them are subject to a materiality assessment. So information that's not material will not have to be disclosed, but the, uh, the regulator, that will be the regulator of companies uh, in each EU state, will determine a threshold of materiality for the information that's got to be disclosed. So the focus in Europe and the UK is on disclosing. We want companies to have a broader focus on stakeholders, but you know it's hard to require them to do that by law. That might be too limiting to their business. But what we will require them to do is to report to, on how they're impacting the environment, society, and their own internal governance structure. In summing up, uh, Justice Strong's jurisprudence interprets legal rights and duties within the context of moral principles. Moral principles should influence uh, a jurist, he, he, he argued, in weighing and balancing the role of regulation to support a fairer society. 
uh, the relevance for today's ESG debate and the corporate purpose uh, debate in particular um, highlights the importance of integrating ethics into corporate governance. And this is where I think Justice Strong has had an enduring influence, although he may not have conceived of, uh, of, 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 of an ethical company at the time he was practicing law in Pennsylvania. He would have agreed, I think, with the fact that we interpret corporate law by having reference to, to moral and ethical values. Uh, is it misleading for a company to state that it owes a moral or social responsibility to its employees or third parties or to broader society? These are questions that we have to ask. Should companies be required? Um, uh, should companies have a legal duty to these broader uh, stakeholders? Uh, what legal obligation is owed to stakeholders? How should it be determined? Uh, should there be legal liability imposed on the board of directors? How broad should that liability be? These are unresolved legal issues that have not yet been fulfilled. There are lawsuits in Europe right now where corporate boards have been sued because companies have violated environmental practices, uh, sustainability practices around the world. Um, the focus in Europe and the UK has been to have more disclosure, that the first step in dealing with this is to re require companies to report on their impact on environmental, social, and governance practices, and also how that environmental ESG issues affect the company's business. So this is called double materiality. So this is the first step in how Europe's dealing with this as, as a regulation. I mean, who can disagree with more disclosure, right? Um, uh, more information for customers, more information for investors. It's not such a bad thing. I mean, there is a, a cost of disclosure. It's compliance is expensive. But yet, uh, if we think of companies as having a broader moral or ethical duty in society, other than just to make more profits for shareholders, this might be a good first step in helping to define what their corporate social duties are by requiring them to report and give us more information on what their impact is on society. So I think we, we can think of Justice Strong uh, as a, he was a business lawyer, a practitioner. He stood for a lot of reforms too. He believed that judges should have limited terms in office. He stepped down in 1880 after 10 years on the court because he was frustrated with his colleagues on the court who were clinging on to their jobs forever so, uh, and, and would not uh, step down. And so, so, so I think Justice Strong, his emphasis on ethical and moral values can give us a very good basis on which to think about corporate governance reform today in the modern society. So thanks very much for listening. Um, well, the first question about lawyers or uh, um, the, um, as I understood the question, um, what was, uh, what can corporate lawyers do to play a role in helping companies provide more sustainable uh, business models? Um, uh, do they have a, a role to play here uh, in that regard? And second of all, what, uh, how was Justice Strong influenced by some of these moral values and principles? Was he, his influence, was it from a, a young age um, or was it more later in his practice uh, as a lawyer? So the first question I, I feel more comfortable with, it's the uh, corporate law pre a question. Um, I think lawyers uh, are important in advising the board and senior management on issues that affect the company's liability. And so, and, what, and lawyers are very good at that, saying what is the legal risk of your decision to follow a certain strategy. And, and so, so I think that in the past, there's not really been much legal risk for a company that decides not to follow an ESG strategy. They, they could, but what there, there is legal risk for a company that decides to pursue a, a strategy that maybe diminishes the profits of the company because shareholders might sue. Shareholders might bring a derivative action on behalf of the company against the board of directors. And so we have, you know, there's examples of this in Europe and in the US. And so what the corporate lawyer has traditionally been more comfortable with is saying, how can we reduce our legal exposure with respect to shareholders being upset because of our, or because of our corporate strategy? 
Um, I think in the future, because the law is changing, you've got new requirements in Europe on disclosure. You have to report your impact on ESG uh, factors in society, and also how ESG affects your company's operations, not just whether it reduces profits or not. So, so the lawyers, I think, can play an important role in coming up with uh, efficient ways for companies to disclose that information to, to, to satisfy the regulator and also to satisfy customers and even investors. Increasingly, investors want more information on ESG, on how companies are fulfilling environmental duties. Um, and, and, not, and, and so it's not just a matter of whether or not the company board is going to be sued by shareholders, but it's about whether or not uh, information is being, meaningful information is being generated to inform other third-party stakeholders. And that will be the future role of companies. And, and we have in the United States, under the Biden administration, the Securities Exchange Commission has adopted new proxy rules for 2024 in which listed U.S. companies will have to disclose their impact on climate change and also disclose the impact of climate change on the company's business. Now, this is a new requirement. It's not in statute. It's you know part of the US debate, the role of the regulators being, is it too broad for the SEC to require this or not? I'm not going to get into that. But, but generally, the, the Biden administration has kind of made a small step in going in the direction of what Europe has done by having more disclosure. By, by requiring companies to report in their proxy statement what their carbon impact is and how carbon in, uh, affects their business, I mean, uh, uh, the climate change. So um, now just as strong in his upbringing, he was um, <clears throat> a very relig religious person. He grew up in Connecticut at a time when religion, when Presbyterianism and Methodism and kind of evangelical Protestantism was mainstream. And this, I think, influenced his moral compass, you might say, from an early age. And it, he later, of course, moving to Pennsylvania, became a, a very respected practitioner in the law. But, it, but, his in, but the influence of religion and morals, I think, affected his values as an abolitionist Democrat. At that time, the Democratic Party, as you know, in the 19th century was dominated by the pro-slavery Democrats. And you know, there were northern Democrats that were not for slavery, but they were in a minority in the party. And so, so Strong uh, in Pennsylvania becomes an example of a, what you might call a moderate Democrat, one who sees the importance of using moral values to interpret the Constitution to give us a better understanding about how the Constitution should apply in society, about whether or not we should have slavery or not. And he, and he thought slavery was abhorrent. It should be done away with. And, and, the, and, and I think he was really appalled at what happened in the Civil War, and that was why he led the National Reform Association in the, in the late 1860s to amend the U.S. Constitution. He felt that there needed to be more recognition in the U.S. Constitution of, 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 of Christianity, of, of the Bible, uh, of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, as he called it. But yet, and we can all, of course, question that today with hindsight, that that's probably too strong of an emphasis. But yet, at the time, I think he was responding to this uh, period in American society where there was sort of moral decay, and you had this horrible war, and, 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 and his response was to, apply more, was to apply moral principles. So, so I hope I made some, yes, yes, sir, yes. It, or structure, or is it fundamentally different? Well, it, it's similar in some regards. The environmental laws that were passed in the early 1970s were mandated by statute. Um, the EPA was created. Uh, William Ruckelshaus was the great, you know, kind of moderate Republican that led. He was in the Nixon administration and adopted the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and and this was an important time of reform in the U.S. in which the EPA had broad regulatory authority to write these regulatory rules. And so and so and I think what's happened over the last 30 or 40 years, at least in the U.S., is that we've relied on federal agencies to kind of write up the rules. But now the, the power of the federal agencies have been has been tr tested by the U.S. Supreme Court, as you know, in the recent Supreme Court decisions limiting the federal agency discretion to write such rules. And, and, and what Elizabeth Warren advocates is that we have statutory intervention uh, to make it clear that companies have an environmental and social uh, uh, duty uh, to, to report and, and, and to have 
a broader objective simply than to have shareholder wealth maximization. And, and so she's advocating, I think, a, a, what I would say is a strong statutory intervention because the regulatory approach has hit a, a bump in the road and is not really working uh, so well at the moment. Yes. Uh, so fascinating uh, presentation, thank you. Um, so I recently read an article, a law review article, um, it's called The Millennial Corporation, and basically what the authors argue is that this rise of the e ESG movement, it, it is a result, they describe it as a result of, of social demand. So what they are basically arguing is that this increasing demand for socially responsible corporate behavior is attributed to uh, what millennial demands, because what they're saying, the millennial generation, they're demanding uh, corporations to, to, you know, pushing for socially responsible, being, uh, you know, advocating for social justice, uh, um, social justice agenda. So, for example, take boycotts on Russia as you know an investor yeah. in the Ukraine. Mm -hmm. But basically, the young generation, it, it's a demand for 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 socially uh, responsible practices. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think it's a very good point that ESG has become more mainstream and that the younger generation, the millennials, think it's very important to know what kind of company it is I'm buying my products from. And it used to be that we're happy to get a cheap pair of running shoes, but we want to know what Nike's doing. How do they make their shoes? Do they use child labor? in faraway places, even though that might be completely legal to do, uh, but is it ethical to do? And, and so I think there's increasing customer demand that companies at least report and give more information about how they make their money. Uh, are they doing things that customers might object to in principle? And that it's not just enough that I get a good product and I'm happy with my running shoes, I wanna know how these shoes are made. So I think it's a very important point. I think companies are responding to customer sentiment in that regard. And, and that's why I think the disclosure requirements are very important in Europe now because although these are exacting compliance requirements, they will be costly for companies to comply with. They are going to give more information, not just to investors, but they're going to give information to third-party stakeholders like customers, suppliers, uh, and, and, and other companies that you do business with. It may be that you as a business person don't want to do business with a company that has certain practices that you find to be objectionable on an ethical basis or on a moral basis. And having more information on what the company does, I think, is really how I see corporate governance headed. And companies can continue to do business with abhorrent actors, maybe, if it's not unlawful, but, but they will have to report it. And, and, and there will be on pains of misreporting and having fines and sanctions if they don't report accurately. So, so I think this is really uh, the, how corporate governance will evolve. It's uh, more disclosure is a, is a more, uh, it's, it's hard to disagree with more disclosure g generally. Um, but it is costly. Those who run businesses are going to say this is a costly compliance requirement. Uh, we're being saddled with this. U.S. companies that do business in Europe are going to be subjected to the disclosure requirements. So it's either you stop doing business with European counterparty companies or you, or you start disclosing to the EU regulator your, uh, uh, what your impact is on environmental and social standards. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I that's. Yeah, no, I think that's a very good point. Yes, uh, yes, sir. How would one advise a director of a British company under that form of government who says, well, I, I'd like to do more for the employees, or I'd like to do more for the customers, or I'd like to mm -hmm. do more for the ozone layer, or whatever, and, and can pretty much use his own discretion, can he? Uh, so how, how could you bring a shareholder's derivative action when the fiduciary duty is so diffuse? That's a very good point. I mean, is, or, or is this, uh, and, and these duties are what the, the UK company lawyer will tell you are secondary objectives. The primary objective is to promote the success of the company for the benefit of its members as a whole. 
So, so that in itself, you know, as a whole, the company as a whole, um, uh, is it in the short term or the long term? So there's some questions there the company lawyer would have to deal with. But then, and, and in doing so, have regard, amongst other things, to these what they refer to as secondary objectives. Uh, the, the, the performances of its decision, I mean, the impact of the company decision, the board's decision on the long term, uh, the interest of, of employees, uh, the interest of supply, business relationships with suppliers, customers, and others. And, and so it, there, there are a lot of, there are multiple constituencies there that, that you, the board of directors, are having to deal with. And how do you um, classify who has a priority? And, and, and how do, is there a certain hierarchy of, of stakeholders that you look to? Uh, are you more concerned with the customers or with the employees? And, and these are questions yet, these are questions where the statute is ambiguous. And, and, and that there's just a general duty that the board should be taking into account the interests of these third parties. And, and so, um, so in litigation on, on this, uh, there hasn't been a lot of litigation yet, but, but there are some decisions in which uh, the courts have basically have upheld the, the discretion of the board to, to, to decide, uh, as long as they're deciding in good faith. Uh, and as long as there's a record to show that they took into account the interest of these other stakeholder groups. They don't have to necessarily do what was best for a particular stakeholder, but they have to show that through good faith, deliberation, procedure, transparent procedures, and how they report, how they deliberate it. And if they do that, they kind of tick the legal box to reduce their liability. Um, and that's sort of the, the roadmap that most UK companies have been following. Um, however, I think um, over time, this concern that directors will have, it will become a more urgent business concern. Uh, th th they will find that customers care more about how the company is reported to treat its other stakeholders, and that this will become a more urgent uh, business objective for companies to do that. Um, and, but, but it's a very good question because you have multiple constituencies, all these different interests, how do you balance them? Uh, essentially, under the law, the board of directors have got discretion to use good faith in balancing that. Uh, yeah, so, but it's a very good uh, corporate board type question. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. we've, we've exhausted our time, so uh, please join me in thanking Professor Albert.